Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for the today's Continuous Improvement in Nonprofit Organizations webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us here on the last day of summer uh, and uh, going to spend the next hour with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. My name is Gary Dubas. I'm a partner with McCauley and Asbury, uh, Director of Nonprofit Services, which I really co-direct with uh, Jim Schellenberg. Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know about McConnell and Asbury, we're an accounting and advisory services firm uh, with offices in Camp Hill, Lancaster, and Bloomsburg. Uh, we, of course, provide a, a wide range of services uh, across a variety of industries. And uh, as you can see on the screen, and we encourage you to visit our website to learn more about our firm. If you've uh, if you joined us uh, on past webinars, uh, welcome back. And if you haven't, our monthly webinars feature various business topics to keep you updated on what's going on in the world around us. Uh, be sure to check out our website to catch past presentations, as well as information through our blog. Uh, we are thrilled to have Steve Sullivan with us here today for our uh, discussion on continuous improvement. Steve is uh, CEO of Community Aid, and most of you, I would assume, know about Community Aid. Uh, they've got uh, seven thrift, thrift stores, uh, throughout central Pennsylvania, uh, the most recent that was uh, opened uh, in Berks County. And congratulations uh, to Steve about that. I know it's exciting times uh, to expand into the Reading market. Uh, uh, but Steve has over 20 years of experience, uh, uh, and you can see on the slide uh, the, the full bio, but uh, interesting is that uh, uh, he worked with eight Fortune 100 companies, uh, in uh, retailing, manufacturing areas uh, with various products, et cetera. And uh, with his uh, passion for nonprofit organizations, he, he joined uh, four years ago, Community Aid, and has taken them on a uh, dynamic run since, uh, since getting there. Uh, uh, hello, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. I love this picture. Um, that was probably taken six seven years ago and man the grays have crept in since that shot so uh i'd love to see that. get a big chuckle out of that one i don't know uh, i forgot that i gave you that so pleasure to be with you guys great so the uh the theme as we've uh, mentioned and we've advertised is continuous improvement as a nonprofit organization uh, i often hear is that if you are not moving forward you're not continuously improving you actually are losing ground uh, and so that's kind of the theme here today we're going to hit several uh, key areas when it comes to uh, this topic culture is going to be the first one branding making the numbers work. We are accountants. We got to talk a little bit about numbers, uh, that's for sure. And then uh, collaboration as well. Uh, uh, Steve, I think Steve is a wannabe accountant also. I, he, I know he likes numbers. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit of numbers. Uh, so let's get this started. Yeah, so just a couple of housekeeping items before we get going today. Uh, if you have any questions for us during today's presentation, please submit them to us through the built-in chat feature in the webinar control panel on your screen. We'll do our best to answer throughout the webinar itself, uh, and if we don't get to it, we will certainly follow up with those. For those of you who are attending today for CPE purposes, and I know there's a lot of you out there, please keep in mind that there'll be four polling questions throughout today's presentation. The first one is on your screen now. So if you're listening to me, the first polling question is on your screen now. You will need to answer all four of these questions to get your certificate, which will be emailed to you in a few weeks after the webinar is concluded today. So I'm going to leave the poll open for about 20 seconds. Please answer this if you would like CPE credit.
All right. So it looks like 80% of you today are here for CPE purposes. Well, I'm glad glad for that, but I'm also glad that you have an opportunity to hear from Steve today as well, because it's going to be a great conversation. So we're going to get started with our first theme today, and I'm going to kick it back to Gary, who's going to get us going. All right. Thanks, Jim. So uh, again, our first topic is revolving around culture. And uh, so the first question for you today, Steve, is uh, how important is culture to your organization? And what strategies have you used to evolve the culture at Community 8? Thanks. You, you, um, you hit on one of my favorite topics. Uh, let's start with the why. Why is it one of my favorite topics? Um, and there's a, a strategist that is fond of saying, and I'm fond of repeating, um, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So whether you're a nonprofit or whether you're a for-profit, you have strategies. Your strategies achieve your strategic goals. And I have seen multiple leaders fail because their culture did not support their strategic ambitions. They wanted to achieve X, Y, and Z by timeframe A, B, and C. And really at the end of the day, their organization couldn't support their ambitions because their culture wasn't set appropriately. So said a different way, I believe culture needs to be exceptionally intentional. So I'm fond of telling people, culture's not one of the things, culture is the most important thing. Um, you know, a, a leader with no followers is just some bloke out for a walk all by himself. You need your people to follow you. You need to achieve the things that you want to achieve. You need to make sure that your people are engaged with you and have and understand the purpose of the why you do what you do. And I think that is conveyed through culture. So the, the strategy that we've implemented is to integrate our strategy, our culture into our everyday rituals. So think of it this way. We developed core values. We said, these are our three core values. And actually, I, ha I have a slide for that. So could you give me the opportunity to share that one slide? So we, we declared, look, we have a set of core values. Ownership, platinum rule, fruit of the spirit. We came up with these three concepts and most organizations will come up with core values and they'll either sit on a shelf, get plastered on a wall, and oftentimes they aren't really activated. And so understanding that cultures oftentimes don't get activated and, and if it's so important to me, culture, to how I win, I've got to find a way to make it and breathe life into it and integrate it into everyday activities. So we turn those core behaviors, those core values into core behaviors. And so we actually turned our three core values into 12 core behaviors, which we talk about every day. So I'll give you an example. We have a, um, a behavior called choose joy. Now, joy by definition is not a temporary state like happiness. Joy is choosing to recognize the good things in your life so that you can embrace um, the way life can be activated through our, our Christian culture. And so we have this concept, choosing to respond to circumstances with contentment and hope, choosing to be positive. As a mindset then, we took a core value and turned it into an everyday behavior. And so for six days a week, we will talk about choosing joy every morning in our huddles. We start every meeting with a review of the behavior of the week. So uh, I'll give you an example of how we do that. One of them was take ownership. So we have this daily bread concept. Every day we'll talk about one behavior for six days and we'll read from this behavior of the week sheet we call daily bread. And we review 
what it means. So you can see what it says up in the upper right there. Taking ownership at work means to be proactive in your job role and understand the purpose of your job duties. We go through this review of what is taking ownership? What does it mean to us? And we tackle a, a discussion point. Taking ownership of your work helps with motivation in your job role. I'm reading from the second, from the middle section. Someone give me an example of what this behavior looks like at Community Aid. So we're taking the ownership behavior and we're actualizing it into what do you, my employees, see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on how to take ownership. And we share how taking ownership is actualized in our daily activity through this daily bread exercise. So it just gives you a feel for how we've taken a core value, turned it into a core behavior, and eventually ritualized it so that we're talking about it every single day. We made it the most important thing, taking out the opportunity to do our daily work of productivity, which is running a thrift store for us, to actually sit down and talk about how we do what we do. By the way, I, I didn't spend any time talking about what community aid is, and I probably should just, Gary, do you mind if I just take a step back? Because- Absolutely, go ahead, sure. Really, to understand the context of, of why I'm talking about the things I'm talking about, it might be helpful. Look, we, we run um, seven thrift store and donation centers. We take gently used clothes. We put painstaking efforts into getting the right quality product onto the floor. So we reject quite a bit of product that gets donated to us because it'll have a stain, it'll have a rip. Goodness, you gotta see half of my clothes. I can't donate my clothes because I have holes in everything. Um, the bottom line is we go for a, a very high quality type of product that we put on the floor. And anyways, so we do that across seven stores and seven markets. Our average selling price is $3.50. So you could get, for instance, you go um, spend, you buy seven items, you're going to spend around $21. You could have products from Coach, Gucci, you name your top brand, Lululemon, we have the products there, they're gently used and they're of high quality. And this is how we generate our revenues, how we generate our, our cash profits. We'll sell it at $3.50. We pay our employees a very high rate. Um, we're we're in, in the $16 range on average wage across the organization. For retail, that's a very that's an attractive looking rate. Um, and then we take the proceeds and we funnel it to the foundation. 10% of all revenues go to a foundation which gives money philanthropically, which invests in nonprofit leaders by providing free leadership development and um, in shared services. Um, shared services to try to help lower the costs of, of nonprofits. I'll give you an example. We're working on a shared service that would tackle uh, health care for nonprofits. So what would happen if 300 nonprofits got together and um, started sharing their healthcare costs and went to market together as an organization. That is an example of, sh of lowering the, your back office costs so that you can put more money towards your, your mission, your, your nonprofit mission. Right, so that's a little bit about what we do and how we do it. And to put into context, in order to do those things, we've set some very ambitious goals in order to achieve those large, big, hairy, audacious goals. We tackle it by putting culture first so that everyone is engaged in where we're going. Uh, so that's just not Steve rattling on about a concept. It is uh, everyone on board rowing in the same direction. So Gary, I was a little verbose. Jim, I was a little verbose. Help me no, uh, bring it around. Steve, that's, that's wonderful. I, I really liked how you said how you when it comes to culture, you activate your core values and you make it part of your everyday language within your organization. I'm curious, as you have done that, have you met any resistance mm -hmm. internally? And maybe there's some stories there that you could share. Um, 
Sure. Look, uh, change is difficult. All organizations struggle with change management. With anything that you want to do that's new, the failure rate is exceptionally high, whether it's a new product launch in the for-profit world, whether it's a shift in direction in the nonprofit world with a new ambitious goal. Change is difficult to absorb. And so when I came on board four years ago, I came with the intention, the board had asked me, you need, Steve, how are you going to fix our broken culture? Um, it's fractured, it needs healing. And so, um, well, we're a Christian nonprofit, so you saw one of our values was fruit of the spirit, and there are nine behaviors associated with the fruit of the spirit. Actually, 10 if you include um, practicing humility. The idea that we're talking about, hey, I need you to do your job, and your job has a job standard. And let's say your job is hanging um, five clothes on a rack every 15 minutes, right? You're supposed to hit a certain standard. Just bear with, with the poor example. It's not just what you do. It's how you do what you do. And when they started to grasp that Steve is up there saying how you do is more important than what you do, they're like, oh, my goodness, this is so different. So that was the first thing. How we do what we do was more important, right? Um, the second piece of it is as a Christian organization, Christ-centered organization, I got a lot of the, um, you know what, I'm not at church. Why are you talking about Christ-like behaviors? So I got a lot of that um, because you don't need to believe what I believe to work in this organization. You don't need to be a, a Christian. But I chose these, um, these behaviors intentionally to heal a fractured, broken culture. So hopefully that, that gets to the yeah. point of where you were going, Jim. Definitely. For, uh, for uh, the nonprofits that are on the uh, webinar today, uh, and they're thinking like, hey, we'd love to do uh, what you've done when it comes to core values in terms of implementing your culture. Uh, just briefly, how did you get that accomplished to get it down to concise, specific uh, core values, et cetera. Did you, uh, did you have a consultant help you? You know, what, what were the practical steps? So I went out, um, I worked first, I, I put somebody accountable in addition to me. And I made sure that that person reported to me. If it's so important, I want to know about it. Second, um, we went out and we did the easy thing. We just typed into Google change my culture. It was that simple, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's that simple, right? We started using a, a firm that we picked up and they had a methodology to implementing culture. There's lots of them out there. I don't want to give a, a free paid, a free uh, advertisement to, to any one of them. But there was someone that showed us that um, to, to make the transformation work, you had to go from values on a wall to behaviors in every day. And they have a methodology for driving your values into behaviors. Choose whatever values you want, choose whatever behaviors you want. They had a methodology. And so much of that was ritualiz ritualizing every day, having the same ritual every day. They're hearing the same thing over and over again. And that um, your values and behaviors are modeled from the top of the organization. That is so important. So in our case, it's the bottom of the organization because we have a servant leadership organization where Steve, as the CEO, is at the bottom. And I serve a leadership team, and they serve their direct reports, and they serve their direct, direct reports. So the most important people in the organization are on the front line of the organization. They're the ones running the racks, touching all the clothes. Um, doing all the great things, loving all the people. And so if I'm not at the bottom of the organization demonstrating the culture and my leaders aren't demonstrating it, you're going to get nowhere. We all have to model it uh, in order for people to buy in and for people to want to change. If you exhibit toxic behaviors, you're going to have a toxic culture. 
if you exhibit exemplary behaviors that drive the kind of culture that you want, then they'll get mirrored over time. But change is slow. Multiple years. I've been at this for two and a half years with this methodology. And I don't think I'm ever going to be done. I think it is continuous. And it's an investment that I choose to make because culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. See, I just have kind of one follow-up question for culture is, did you, maybe how do you involve your board of directors in that? As you're talking about yourself and, you know, their direct reports and direct reports and the frontline individuals who are serving the customers and clients of your organization, how do you involve the board of directors in this process as well? Or did you? Or did you so do let's start by saying, I serve at the board's pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, they chose me. Uh, I chose them, but they also chose me. Um, I told them we're going to develop a culture committed to Christ like behaviors, and they bought it. Um, then I told them what the core values were going to be. And I did that all in the interview process. So walking in, we were aligned on what was most important to me, uh, which was this culture. Because I didn't want to come in and make the same mistakes I saw at previous company X, previous company Y, previous company Z, or what I'd seen out in the marketplace. If I'm going to come in and I'm going to do this, I want to win. And I'm going to do it with culture because I've seen so many people fail at it. So in order to get them on board, I got them on board at, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I start every one of my board meetings like I start my meetings and I start my mornings with my teams. We open up with our daily bread. So we have a board meeting and it might be um, practice humility week. And so there's Steve. Let's see if I can. Uh, can you give me control to show you a quick slide? So there's Steve um, in front of his board of directors. And he's reading to them. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Admitting when we make mistakes and learning from them. This is Steve talking to his bosses, this is great. The opposite of humility is pride. Humility is not overestimating ourselves and our abilities. Simply put, humility means not better than anyone else. So how do I get them to buy in? Same way I get everybody else. Yes. We're just gonna do it every time I see you through repetition, yeah. Thanks for letting me share that. I love sure. using uh, humility as an example because it is such a different concept from the way a lot of organizations in the for-profit world work, which is why I came here. Right? Yeah. Steve, I have a feeling you could probably talk about culture for hours on end, but we're gonna we're gonna move a little bit to a, a new topic here in a second. And I think before we do that, I'm going to ask that we launch our next polling question. That way we can get those individuals who are looking for CPE and 80% of you guys do want CPE, so we wanna make sure we meet our standards with the state. So we're gonna launch our next polling question here. So if you're listening to my voice and hear me say polling question, please answer that one on your screen right now. All right, so the question was, I decided to attend this webinar because I work for a not-for-profit organization. So 55% of you are working with a nonprofit organization. I see 30, just about 30% were here just for the credits, and I see some volunteers, board members, as well as some vendors of the, uh, of the nonprofit industry as well. So quite a, quite a good mix there as well. So we're gonna move into our, our second topic here, Steve, and, and you just had mentioned a second ago um, some similarities and differences with, with for-profit entities. 
And the next concept really is around, I don't want to talk about is around branding. And mm -hmm. the concept of branding is really often associated with for-profit entities. Um, I went and looked up the definition of what branding, how it's defined. And it's the promotion of a particular product or company by means of advertising and distinctive design. Mm. So I'm curious with your for-profit background and what you're doing with community aid, what are you doing in the area and areas of branding? Yeah. So let me try redefining branding the way that I think about it. So when you think of an Apple product, what do you think of? Gary, what do you think of when um, someone says Apple product to you? Think um, of just technology, Steve and Jobs. Uh, app. Huh. I think it just works. It just works. Yeah. So, so what I think about them is everything is functional and works together. It's beautiful design. It is. Um, exceptionally functional it is intuitive um it's art and it's bleeding edge or at least cutting edge those are things you think of when you hear apple that is how i think about brands so when you think of community aid i want you to think high quality low price i want you to think um you know what? They give 10% of their revenues, $3 million a year, away to other nonprofits that support food insecurity, uh, the unhoused, and basic human needs. I want you to think about what it is we do, why we do it, how we do it. That to me is branding. And so, in order to get you to think like that, and this is another one of those that you know, I'm four years into this and I feel like this might take me 10 years to get the brand just right, to get you to think about it the way that I want to think, want you to think about it. And, it. and it costs money. It takes a lot of money and a lot of effort to convey that brand and to get them to get them, get our target audiences to recognize what that is. So let me show you a little bit about how we've thought about it. Can I have the screen again? Use this tool to try to define for ourselves. Do you see um, a brand wheel? Brand wheel. Yeah. This is a brand wheel. Um, nothing too much rocket science. This is more of a, an internal tool that says, how do we define who we are, and we do it by asking ourselves, how does community aid make me feel? How does it make me look? And I'm, I'm in the outer circles of, the outer portions of the circle. What does community aid do for me? How would I describe community aid? And at the bottom half of the circle is emotional thought. At the top half, it's rational thought. On the inside, there's facts and symbols and brand personality. This is just a helpful tool to say, who do I want? What do I want you to think of? Who do I want my brand to represent? What, what does it say about me? And when we did this four years ago, and, and granted, we need, to, um, we need to adjust this. At the core, we wanted to be known for our humility, our philanthropy, our integrity the quality of our products. So that's why it's at the center of that circle. And what I want is for a consumer, and now I'm gonna go up to the upper right-hand corner of the quadrant. What I want from a consumer is to say, how would I describe community aid? I want them to say, trustworthy, determined, community-focused, faith-led, strong values. And so then I have to ask myself, how do I, get them to think that. What do I need to do in my behaviors and my actions and my advertising in the way I do what I do, how I do it, in order to be very intentional to communicate this? So when you say 
you know, what did you do to try to build your brand? First, I run this business like a for-profit business. So I am investing over 2%, between 2 and 4% of revenue in brand building. In It's not just advertising, but it's what are those things that I need to do to make sure that you see determined, people-oriented, trustworthy, those behaviors. This is a really intentional effort and takes a lot of work. But for a nonprofit who's staying true to their mission, if you are communicating effectively, repeatedly, over and over again, you're gonna laugh at me. Internally in my marketing group, let me let me stop sharing. So you can actually see the pain at which I, I say this. Um, internally in my marketing group, I actually use former President Trump as an excellent example of how to convey a brand. And so this is not a political statement one way or the other. But former President Trump has a way of saying something over and over and over again. He says it this way, he says it that way, he says it the other way, but he keeps on saying it to the point where you really begin to believe it's true, right? And so if I'm a nonprofit and I'm telling you, we're here to serve the homeless population of whatever county I'm in, and I'm doing that because I have exceptional efficacy, I am making a difference, and I say this over and over and over again, it's going to make a difference and it's going to be part of your brand. This repetition, this targeted, who am I actually talking to, right? Who am I focusing these, these messages to? When we start to think through that, much like I did, remember I had four quadrants to that circle. One of them was how would a consumer do it? Um, and then what? The, how does the consumer actually say, what does it do for me? What, how does it make me look? How does it make me feel? This is an all-encompassing effort at looking at that target and trying to say, what does my brand stand for? Yeah. Sorry, Jim, I could probably talk about. Oh, no, that, that's great. I mean, I'm just thinking about, Steve, like you're, you're definitely on a journey of, of branding, right? It's, it's, you've had to do some work and you're continuing to do work in that area. Anything during that journey so far that has kind of made you change direction or mm -hmm. kind of pivot, or maybe something that came came to light that you initially didn't think of as you were exploring, you know, some of those four quadrants that you yeah. just described. Look, you you need to be intentional with your brand, and if you don't own it, direct it, convey it, someone else will do it for you. And so, in the midst of the pandemic, some of you may have um, have seen our external metal bins out in the environment. Driving down the street, you see a, a beige bin with our name on it. And um, there are those that will donate to us in that format. And sometimes the level of over exuberance will have them put it outside of the bin. You know, we try to say, please put product inside the bin, don't leave it outside the bin. We call that dumping. Dumping during the pandemic became a brand destroyer for us. We became associated with, um, well, all the unpleasant things that go with dirt, grime, dirty clothes, dirty donations. Um, so it made me want to reduce how many bins we had. It made me want to change my strategy on how do we collect donations. It had a major impact on go-to-market strategy. Speaking yeah. of which, a nonprofit should have a go-to-market strategy, right? A brand, how, how are you going to implement that brand, that culture? Um, and sooner or later, you're going to ask me about numbers. So um, how, the, how is your go-to-market strategy going to impact those widgets that uh, accountants and financial people love to talk about? Maybe just you know, kind of briefly, Steve, you can explain what a go-to-market strategy is for us. <laughs> can I... Uh, yeah. Can I have uh, the view again? I'll give you one more slide. Just because I'm slide happy. It's an awesome crutch, having slides. 
And I, I will just remind the audience too, if you do have questions for Steve, he did agree in advance and he'll tell me this, that he will answer questions on the fly. So if you have a question, certainly put that through the, the chat feature of the webinar control panel and we'll get those to Steve today. So think of community aid who's not in com competition with Goodwill or Salvation Army because they've got good missions. Think of us in competition with Ross, Burlington, Gates, right? And the way that we choose to win, this is my go-to-market strategy definition, the way we choose to win, how are we going to win is low price and high value. So this is how I explain it. It's Salvation Army and Goodwill don't have the bandwidth because of the way that they go to market to get at the high quality product. We're paying people 16 bucks an hour and making them professionals. They're using, in some cases, volunteers, right? So it's a completely different approach. So that's what gives us the opportunity to get down that curve on high value. Low price, it's part of our proposition. We're built on volume. So when I say go to market strategy, my team knows that we're winning with high volume, low price, half a million items out the door a month, right? They know how we're gonna win by making our consumers happy, great value and loving them up, right? So that's part of the go-to-market strategy. Question. That's great. Let's go on to the, the next thing here, Jim. All right, I just wanted to, uh, we'll go ahead and launch one more poll here once the uh, presentation comes back up. Again, I want to make sure everybody gets their CP credit who is looking for that. So the next question, polling question, if you're listening to my voice, make sure you uh, answer the polling question on the screen. I feel like my organization does a good job at branding itself in the community. Yes, yes, but there's room for improvement or no. So we'll give you about 20 seconds of silence to answer this question. Polling question number three. Right, so it looks like I do that quick math, about 94% think you're doing a good job and 78% of you think you have room for improvement. So that's some, some good responses there from, from the group. So we're gonna make a turn in our discussion here, Steve, uh, to something that accountants feel comfortable with. There are a number of accountants on the call today uh, and that is numbers. So really all organizations, regardless of mission, size, type, have to you know, balance the budget. They have to manage resources, manage cash flow. So my question to you is what type of metrics or financial information are you looking at throughout the year to do this at yeah. the same time that you're trying to maximize the impact of, of your mission? Yeah. What do you use to run your business? Um, the first question we need to answer is what does success look like? And getting ourselves our set of KPIs, and I know that's really basic for everybody. Your, your, your key performance indicators are your top level metrics. What's important is if you have, is that you have measures for all the things that need managed. If it isn't measured, it isn't managed. So therefore, I'll have a, an indicator for it. Um, and so it can be at the top of the organization, a next layer down of metrics in the organization that cascade down, or even further down to a tertiary level of KPIs. So I can tell you that as a tertiary level of indicators, I'll give you an example of one of those. I know on average how many Items are in your basket when you check out of the Lancaster store. And I can compare that at a, as a bottom line measure with um, 
that of any other store or historically because it's something we track in detail but that actually rolls up to a revenue number per day so it's important for me to hit a, a revenue month a, a rev, revenue number for the month it's important for me to kick off a certain amount of cash every month and so in in this respect i have measures for each one of those at a high level revenue per day at a supporting level customers per day or um, number of items sold and at a tertiary level of uh, number of items that were in your basket on average right so there are levels of kpis um, but this goes into depending upon the process i'm measuring productivity um, so i figured out with the team what some potential indicators are uh, to say that we are being productive. And so I have a series of productivity measures that I track way back before we even, before I joined the company. I have that measure. Luckily, I can dig back and compare um, how we're doing with that, including how many employees we have, how many hours we put in. Um, a, a great indicator of productivity of, um, if I look at revenue and I look at how many hours I put in, and I can look at how much cash we've kicked off or how much revenue we've brought in, right? There's always a way to tie it back to these top level KPIs. Um, am I going where you wanted me to go? Yeah, you definitely are. Um, it makes me think too, you know, KPIs and, and numbers are, are good, but how, how are you using those with your team? Like, and mm. the it's one thing for you to look at it, Steve, but how is the rest of the organization using that information? And how do they do that? The performance management process and the expectations that I have of someone higher up in my organization. So I've got people that report to me, they've got people that report to them. In the performance management process, there are measures. Our expectation is that this is what you'll deliver. And it's a SMART goal, significant, measurable. Mm -hmm achievable results bound time bound so by december of 2024 you will have delivered this kpi this quantifiable number so it's in the performance management process and so therefore we're talking about it at six month check-ins 12 week check-ins we're managing the progress we all know where we're headed the kpis are all listed there we're reviewing it at the appropriate level so i have a leadership team there is another layer leadership team that we call the senior leaders so we have the community aid leaders which are my direct reports and then we have senior leaders which are their direct reports and we are cascading these metrics all the way up through the organization so that they're reviewing did you hit your your standard did you achieve your metrics so it is a frequent review but you gotta have metrics in place and you got to know what you're measuring yeah. and why you know, in some ways, I think back to your earlier conversation about core values and making it a part of your everyday language. It's really no different with KPIs and some of these key metrics that you're looking at. Yeah, and, and we're not there yet, but where we're headed is how many unfortunate incidents related to culture happened during this time frame? How many call loss did you have? How many, um, which is a great one. What does your um, your drop off in employment? How many people have left? Why did they leave? Um, these are all numbers that we have that we have yet to tie back into performance management with culture. Um, we're taking baby steps and making this progress, but lots to do because those culture numbers tie back into your profit numbers one way or the other. Yep. So I think the a big takeaway for the nonprofit organizations that are on this uh, webinar are really is to drill down into what are their key uh, performance items that they need to be measuring and to have everybody in the organization uh, measure the things that they have uh, ability to control, essentially. Let me give you in a, um, just briefly. A quick example of something that might be more typical of nonprofit metrics. We give away money in our foundation. So we want to give away money 
to drive an impact. So we're trying to measure what would $5,000 to your nonprofit deliver? And we want to 10x our impact. And so we're measuring, did we give enough dollars to high impact areas versus not as high impact areas? Let's say if I gave $5,000 to organization X, they could serve 10 people in a homeless shelter for two weeks. But if I gave it 5,000 to another, they could do a much higher number or a much lower number, right? So we're using those metrics to manage effectively our own efficacy on delivering value and, and driving impact in the community. So maybe that was a little bit closer for those of, of us that aren't actually running a retail store. So forgive me for using too many examples that were, um, that were for-profit oriented. Nope. All very relevant. Uh, we're going to uh, move on to the next topic. And before doing so, we'll answer our last polling question. So again, if you're hearing my voice, we're going to launch our last polling question. And that question is, I feel that my organization has adequate financial resources to achieve its mission and accomplish its short and long-term goals. So go ahead and answer that question for the next 20 seconds. All right, so it looks like about 77% of you think that your organization does have adequate financial resources. 13% said no, and about 11 who are unsure. So that's just an opportunity, I think, to allow yourself to learn more about your organization and see what it is that you, you need. So we'll move into our last uh, theme here for the day, and that is collaboration. And Gary, I'm gonna hand it to you. Great. Uh... So uh, we're going to move pretty quickly here on this one uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but you have a unique concept at Community Aid, uh, and you've talked about it already a little bit uh, regarding your nonprofit partners. Uh, and all the nonprofit organizations, you know, they serve customers, clients, the community at large, members as associations, et cetera. Uh, you have nonprofit partners. Uh, uh, and, and how, how do you serve them? Yeah. So it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship that we're looking for. Um, help me help you um, help our population that we want to reach. So we want to make an impact. We want to help nonprofits make an impact in their target mission. So the way that we can do that is we generate cash that we can give away philanthropically. So we're giving away 10% or $3 million a year right now. When we support you, we are doing it through grants. You are our partners doing it through grants, but also we're looking the symbiotic part of that relationship is we need donations in order to generate that cash. So if you can find a way to, to, to collect donations on your behalf, we'll pay. 11 cents a pound as a thank you for the product that you deliver to us 11 cents a pound which adds up over time and and um you know in a given year there was a point in time where we were collecting 16 million pounds of product a year so one way we help uh support nonprofit partners is through paying for donations or or gifting as a result of the donations a second way is through grants um, because of the profits we derive. And um, a third way was around leadership development. So if you're in the mode of um, providing us clothes, if you're able to be a partner of ours, we'll invest in leadership development for your leaders, for your board members, for your, um, not just your executive director, but those reporting to your executive director. Maybe you want to develop somebody. We've been collecting relationships throughout the community of experts to come in and provide key topics, key seminars for free for those nonprofits. 
so that we, because look, at the end of the day, many nonprofits don't have a budget to invest in their people. They're so mission focused, they wanna deliver good. And so as part of our mission, which is supporting nonprofits, um, we've taken it upon ourselves to develop those relationships and deliver that leadership development um, to our nonprofit partners. So that was philanthropy, donation support through pounds, um, leadership development, and then this, this concept of shared services. Uh, we, we work with partners that provide marketing shared services, trying to lower your cost for marketing, um, accounting shared services, and now we're trying to tackle healthcare. Um, and we're not there yet, but we're working with the government, the state government, to make this uh, a venture that could be shared uh, across all nonprofits in Pennsylvania. Steve, I'm curious with, with all of your collaboration efforts that you're involved with, have there been any unexpected benefits that you've realized as an organization because of that? Um, it highlights for our people the need to give. Give of your time, give of your effort. Um, because we're focused on supporting nonprofit partners, it's a great example for our people to know that it isn't all about us, that we get to practice our humility and trying to help others. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, definitely a theme here for, for all nonprofit organizations is continually continue to look of ways to serve your clients, your customers, and also for them to help you serve them better. You know, uh, often organizations on a for-profit side will take customer surveys, those types of things to, to get that input, but uh, to have an even more intimate relationship to be able to say, what can we do to help you to serve the community at large in a, in a better fashion, more effective fashion? Uh, so I think, I think uh, a lot of entities uh, and uh, leaders that are on this webinar can, can think about that more, about what they can do to uh, impact uh, their, uh, again, their, their key constituents. Is there uh, anything else um, that uh, we wanted to hit on, uh, Steve, regarding um, continuously improving that we haven't hit on uh, with our, our main topics? Uh, and uh, you know, when we were talking about at McConley about doing this uh, this topic, you know, you immediately came to mind community aid in terms of the different things that you're doing. Um, you know, you, you've uh, you've developed a foundation aspect of, of it. Uh, uh, you do the roundup at the at the registers, uh, which is a, a a great concept to uh, uh, to uh, develop uh, funds to to fund your nonprofit partners. Uh, is there anything else that uh, you may want to uh, let our uh, listeners uh, think about? Yeah, sure. Um, I I would tell you that. This isn't a um, this isn't a one man show, right? So we've got 550 employees um, plus, and one of the most important concepts that I would say in terms of continuous improvement is you need to hire people smarter than you. You need to hire people that are as committed and convicted on the same value system as you have. And when you do that, um, you can drive continuous improvement as they then build and hire people smarter than them, convicted like they are, and they do the same for those above them in that pyramid of our organization. So as much as I talk about, hey, we're going to give free leadership development to our nonprofit partners, I'm working on it a lot internally in our own house as well. And it is a journey, right? Because most nonprofits don't have a budget to develop their people. And so how do we, also a nonprofit who is giving away money, who is trying to create cash to expand our impact, how do we do that, uh, develop our people? And it again, it comes back down to those strategies. Um, if 
culture is the most important thing. How do you do that? It, it's really about people. So we have detailed people strategies and it's around hiring talent and hiring really well, being really intentional about what are the characteristics of the people that you're hiring, not just what's on that resume. Tell me about a time when you struggled with um, a debate or you struggled with anger and you didn't handle it well, right? So that's an, an example question of something we might say because it's important that we can pause in patience, one of our core behaviors. So we're interviewing for not just their skills on paper, but their behaviors. So this is, has been such a key finding that I would share with anyone. Look, at the end of the day, you've got to hire talent that's not just smarter than you, but as committed and convicted as you are. I think it's, I think that is uh, the uh, I think key for so many organizations. Uh, you know, is is having uh, people in the boat row in the same direction, the same thought processes, uh, being respectful yeah. to each other, uh, having humility. You know, that type of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's yeah. just excellent advice. You know, hire somebody that's smarter than you. And I always remind Gary, 22 years ago. He hired me, so. <laughs> That's great. Good example, Jim. Good example. It's great. Yeah, I've had an awful lot of fun. Um, I can talk, as you guys can tell, I can talk about community aid and what we do all day long. Thanks for giving me a chance to share some of our messages here in the, in the theme of uh, continuous improvement. I hope that someone found a nugget somewhere in that hour that they can take away. Just take one. Um, but if there is no greater nugget for you to take away, just know that Gary hired smarter than himself. That's great. <laughs> so it really has been a, a great conversation here today, Steve. Thank you so much for, for joining Gary and I, and, and, and thank you for sharing all your, your wisdom and advice and, and nuggets of, of, of good things to us. So I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, if you have any further questions regarding the presentation or the concepts and, and topics of today, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the screen and we'll be happy to assist you. Uh, a reminder that a recording of today's presentation will be posted to our website and our social media sites in a few days. And for those of you who requested CPE and answered the polling questions, those certificates will be mailed to you, emailed to you within the next two weeks. I would like to remind you of a few upcoming events that McConley and Asbury is Happy to host. October is a very busy month for us with an in-person conference as well as two scheduled webinars. So our October 3rd IT Risk Management and Cybersecurity Conference is on October 3rd, being held at the Hershey Country Club. It's an opportunity to hear from industry professionals as they uncover everything from data security in the age of AI to current security vulnerabilities. Coming up on October 10th, uh, our partners at Dale Carnegie are hosting a webinar focused on connecting and collaborating with others. The webinar will explore the impact on professional development and how we apply Dale Carnegie's principles for building trust and rapport. And lastly, on October 31st, we will be holding an ethics webinar. So those CPEs credits that are needed for this year on ethics will be there. And that webinar will be focused on real life applications of ethics in the workplace. So I encourage you to visit our website and register for these and all of our events in the future. So again, thank you for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day.